Creating these classes requires equipment and services that cost money. If you appreciate this education, please think about going to elithecomputerguy.com and offering a one-time or monthly recurring donation. Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and today we're going to be an in doing an introduction to the MySQL structure. So when you're going to be building out a system using MySQL as the database back end, I want to give you an idea of basically, like logically, what does this look like? So what I'm talking about here is today we're going to be talking about the servers, we're going to be talking about the database software, so MySQL, we're going to be talking about the databases themselves, we're going to be talking about the tables, we're going to be talking about the columns, we're going to be talking about the records, data types, basically giving you an, an eagle eye view of when we are talking about a database structure, what does this actually look like so that you can then go and try to figure out each individual component and build out what you need. So this class today is basically just going to be giving you that eagle eye view of what a MySQL structure looks like uh, so that you have a better idea of what's going on. On, uh, when we start going into the more in-depth classes. So for this class today, we are primarily going to be on the whiteboard. Again, I know I have world-class drawing skills, and those drawing skills really help you folks understand how all of these things work and how they all go together. So let's go over the whiteboard so I can start drawing things out to try to explain to you how the MySQL structure looks when you're dealing with it in the real world. So the first thing that we need to go over when we're talking about a MySQL structure or really any kind of database structure is we first need to talk about what is the front end and what is the back end. So you will hear about the front end for applications and you will hear about the back end for applications. So basically what we're talking about with the back end for applications is this is going to be your database system. So this is the overall system. So with us, what we're going to be talking about is of course MySQL, but for your back end, you could have Oracle, you could have MariaDB, you could have some kind of NoSQL uh, solution or whatever. Basically what the back end does is the back end actually stores all of the data so that it can be easily accessed by the front end. Now what are we talking about when we're talking about the front end? So fr the front end is the actual application your users are going to be using in order to access the data in the database, in the back end that you've created. So this may be some kind of web application. So think about something like salesforce.com. Basically, you go to that website, you have a, a web page in front of you, you're able to put inform, in information, you're able to pull out reports. So basically, that's what's called a web front end. Or you might have a mobile front end, right? So if you have your little uh, iPhone or you have your smartphone, somebody creates a native application uh, for that phone. And again, maybe this is a customer relationship management software, maybe this is a, a work order software, again, same time, type of data intensive uh, software, basically what will happen is that mobile app will go back and communicate with your back end in order to be able to push data, basically store that in the database, and then pull it for when you're looking for records or whatever. So when we start talking about things like front ends and back ends, this is what we're talking about. The front end the front end for any of these services or applications is basically the user interface that people are going to be interacting with, whether this is a web interface, whether this is a mobile interface, whether this is a desktop interface, something like that. That is what the front end is. And then the back end is the overall system that contains all of the data that the front end will require to actually give any kind of functionality. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about front ends and back ends. So past this, now let's talk about kind of the physical structure of the MySQL uh, structure that we're gonna be dealing with here. And so basically, if you're going to be using a MySQL database, uh, generally you're going to actually be spinning up or turning on some kind of physical server. Uh, and so basically you have the physical server. So there's a physical server from a company like Dell or Lenovo or something that you just build on your own. So again, you got your CPU, you got your RAM, you got your hard drive, you build it out however you want. Then on, on this physical machine, then you're going to install an operating system. So that operating system is most likely going to be Linux, but it could be Windows or it could even be Mac 
OS, or if you're really cool, I guess some people are still running Solaris out there, right? So basically you're going to install uh, the operating system onto that physical hardware and then onto this, then we are going to install, install the database software. So it is important to understand we're talking about MySQL or MariaDB or any of these other database solutions. This is software, just like Exchange is a piece of software, uh, just like uh, SharePoint is a piece of software. You actually have to <laughs> install this software onto, onto a machine, whether it's a physical machine or a virtual virtual machine. Uh, so then you will be installing MySQL onto your physical or virtual machine. And now you have something to work with. So this is now a database server. And so this database server may be part of your back end for whatever solution that you're providing. Now it is important to understand when you start dealing with databases that you can create things called clusters. So what clusters are, clusters are awesome and clusters are what you should be using if you have that da uh, databases, uh, is basically you can uh, light up multiple different servers install MySQL onto those multiple different servers, and then basically have the uh, databases replicate data amongst all of these different servers so that if one physical or virtual machine fails, uh, the cluster stays up and running. So basically in this instance then, right, if we have a front end here, so if we have a little smart a smartphone and that's trying to communicate back with a server, that's one of the things you have to be thinking about. When it's communicating with a back end, it may be communicating with just one physical or virtual server, or it might be communicating with a whole cluster of these database servers, and basically how, how the data is routed is determined by what you have coded, that type of thing. So the first thing that you need to be thinking about when you're thinking about the, the MySQL structure is that you actually have to have MySQL running on something, right? If you take a database file and just dump it on a server and it doesn't have the, the software to actually run it, uh, then nothing is going to happen. So you're actually going to need to install MySQL onto a physical machine and depending on how complicated your infrastructure is you then may actually create a cluster of these MySQL database ser servers uh, for things like failover reliability load balancing and that type of thing now once we get past the the physical a structure of your database system again with your server with your cluster whatever you have going off your back end then we need to actually go into mysql and see how the databases are actually laid out right so you have your server it has mysql on it and then within MySQL, you're going to have databases, you're going to have tables, you're going to have records, so on and so forth. Now, the important thing to understand with how you design your database within MySQL is it really is up to you. It's, it's how you look at things logically. So basically, when you have databases, when you have tables, you are grouping things together logically. Now, one of the problems you run into the real, in the real world is what you consider logical and what your buddy considers logical may be completely in different things. And so that's one of the issues that you can run into with basically these database structures is that people can design the databases in really insane ways because for them, it made a hell of a lot of sense, even though it doesn't make a lot of sense to anybody else. The big thing is when you're grouping things, what it's supposed to be is it's supposed to be logical. So when people go in to do maintenance on the database, when people go and they, they try to write new code uh, in order to interact with the database, basically when they're trying to do the, the normal you know IT related tasks of the database, it should be rather easy to understand what's going on. Okay, this is the user table, this is the uh, the, the accounts table, this is the, the parts table, this is the vendors table. You should be able to go in and, and very quickly be able to understand what's going on with the database. Uh, the problem is though, that's not a technical thing. You, you can have software work, you can have a database work that's ugly as hell. It can be incredibly ugly and it can be incredibly complicated and nobody can understand what's going on, but the computer can still make it work because it still functionally works. And so that's one of the issues that, that you can run into. Uh, so the first thing when you're dealing with uh, the, the MySQL infrastructure is that the highest level, so the highest level you're gonna be dealing with is what is called the database, right? So within MySQL, so you have MySQL installed on your server, 
server, and then you can create a database. And the important thing to understand here is you can create one database or two databases or 20 databases if you want. Basically, again, these are just logical, uh, high level groupings for all the data that you're going to have. Now, a lot of times, if you have a company, you will just have one single database, right? So you're going to have one single database that's going to have your inventory, that's going to have your users, that's going to have your invoicing system, and the whole nine yards, right? So that may be what you want to do. Because one of the, the, the cool things with these databases is you can actually have like user accounts for the databases. So what permissions people have these particular databases, you can have that type of thing. And so one of the things you may think about, right? So you have a small company. So you have a small company, you have five people in your company, and you say, you know, I don't want to make a really complicated uh, database structure, so I will have a single database that will contain all of our tables, that will contain all of our data, because I feel pretty secure with that, right? But the question becomes is what happens if you have a larger company? Let's say you have a company of like a thousand people, and that company with a thousand people has uh, sales. Uh, it also has some kind of uh, kind of like technicians that go out and uh, do things, you know, out in the real world. Uh, maybe it has some kind of logistics uh, system, you know, inventory, all of that kind of thing. And so something you need to be thinking about, again, from a security standpoint, is do you want everything in one database? Do you want your salespeople and your technicians and your logistics people and everybody else being able to hammer one single database? Or does it make more sense to have separate databases? So you could have a CRM, basically you could build a CRM database. And then you could build a work order uh, database, and then you could build like an inventory and uh, basically logistics, you know, tracking or whatever uh, database, and then maybe actually like a sales and invoice database. Right, so basically, the salespeople they will go to a, a, a one front end, and that front end will point back to the CRM database, and then the technicians they are going to go to their front end. Right, so let's say the salespeople they're sitting down there in the office, they go to a web interface, and so that web interface connects back to the CRM database that you've created. Right, and so that's all it connects to, and then the technicians uh, you develop a native app uh, for some for their mobile devices, Android or iOS, and the technicians, they point back to the, the work order. A database. And so the thing is, the salespeople only are able to connect to the CRM database, and the technicians are only able to connect to the work order database. Then you have the logistics folks, uh, and there, again, you create some kind of other front end for them, and they're only able to connect to the inventory and logistics database. Why this is important is because then that spreads the load, so the actual resource load, uh, to these different databases. So one database isn't getting hammered by every single user in the company. And also from a security standpoint, right, you know, sales are probably your most vulnerable uh, people, right? If somebody can try to hack into the sales system, um, that's probably going to be the easiest. So if they hack into the sales system and all they're able to get to is a CRM database, I mean, <laughs> it is horrible. Don't get me wrong, it's horrible. But the worst thing that'll happen is your CRM database will go down, right? So if you have a corruption, if something stupid happens, if, if bad data goes in and starts screwing everything up, the worst case scenario here is then that one database that will get corrupted and then you'll have a nightmare trying to get that back up online but your technicians will still be able to work your logistics will still be able to work and maybe you know your sales and your enforcing that that will still be able to work and so that's one of the things to be thinking about again do you want everything in one single database so for security for corruption for any kind of problems you know load balancing or whatever else do you all do you want it in one database or do you want to spread it out and the important thing to understand here is remember when I was talking about those front ends so we talked about the front ends that then communicate back with the databases remember you can have a front end that can actually communicate to multiple databases so let's say you have some technicians and let's say you have oops, let's say you have like a lead technician so you have this system here and so sales go to CRM and normal technicians go to the work order well even though these are separate databases, right, you're creating a front end. And a front end can connect to one database or multiple different databases. So let's say you have lead technicians. So let's say the lead technicians are the ones that can go in. They can do work orders. They can do work. But let's say they can also sell, too. 
So you could create a front end for these lead technicians, and the front end could connect to the work order database, and it could connect to the CRM database, and it could connect to the sales and invoice database. And so that's an important thing to be thinking about when you think about create a creating a database, um, is how many of these do you want? Is it logical to have everything in one single database, all your data for your company or organization in one single database? Or does it make more sense to spread out the information to these different databases, again, from a security and from a liability standpoint, um, a reliability standpoint? And then, if you need to be able to pull information from the different databases, literally, you can just simply write code. It's as easy to write code to connect to two databases as it is to write code to connect to one database and be able to fill out the information in whatever application or front end that you have. And so the first thing you need to be thinking about is this, 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 this highest level, and that is the database on the database server. So then once you've created your database, then within the database, you create tables. And so tables, more or less, when you visually look at them, uh, they basically look like spreadsheets, right? So if you've ever opened up, again, PHP My Admin or Access or something like that, you will see tables and basically, again, they more or less look like a spreadsheet. Um, and so with, uh, with tables, uh, you have columns. So columns... These are basically what data that you're going to be accepting into the database, right? So let's say this is a users uh, table. So you're gonna create a table for users, right? And so if you're gonna create a table for users, the first thing that you want is a user ID. So whenever you're going to be creating a table, you want some ID for the records within the table. And this will generally be something called the primary key. So what the primary key is, is again, remember in the database world, in the computer world, uh, computers, can't, uh, c computers can't think on their feet. <laughs> They can't, they can't uh, assume what you mean, right? They, they can only do whatever they're coded to do. And so one of the big problems you can get into with databases is what happens if you have two records that are literally identical, literally identical. So when you go to do a search, that's gonna run into problems because then you're gonna get two identical records and it's, going, it's just going to become a mess. And so what the primary key is, is the primary key is the way to, to make sure every single record is unique within the table. So basically, generally with a primary key, you do something called auto increment. And, and basically, as new records are created, uh, it counts up. So record one, record two, record three, record four, record five, that type of thing, right? So the first, the first column you're going to have in a table is generally going to be your primary key. It's going to be something such as a user ID, a part ID, an invoice ID, an account ID, blah, 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 blah. Um, in the beginning, to make it easiest, you will make that an auto increment thing. So basically, as new records are created, it simply goes up. So this will be uh, user ID 1, user ID 2, user ID 3, user ID 4, user ID 5. And so what this means is that within the table, even if the other columns have identical information in them, at least this one column in front will be different. Then past that, uh, then you can have, let's say, like the, uh, the, the first name. So if this is a user, you can have the first name. So that's that's a field. So if you're going to be putting that uh, the, that that type of data into your your table, uh, then again maybe you can have something like an email address if that's what you want, and then maybe you can have something possibly such as you know the person's age. So depending on what you're going to be doing, and so these this is the type of data that you're going to be pulling in to this database. Now once you have the columns. Then you, can all, then you can also say what the data type is. So this is an important thing in the database world. Um, how do you add Bob plus Sue? Riddle me this, riddle me that. Bob plus one divided by Twinkie equals what? A mess, a garbage, it's absolutely horrible. And so you have what are called uh, data types. And so what data types are is you say what kind of data you want these columns to be able to accept. So if you're asking for a first name or a last name or that type of thing, you will then say just simply text. So the data type for that is text. Uh, if you have email, probably that, you'd either use text or something called var char. Uh, we'll talk about the data types later. We'll go in more in depth with that later. But basically, it'll be text or var char. And then age, though, right? Age. 
that you want it to be a number. So that you would have an integer. So you would have what's called an int. So that's just basically just a number, right? And so the important thing here is if, if you're doing calculations based off of age, so let's say you want the average age of all the users in this particular table, um, you know, what you don't want is somehow Bob to be a record, right? You don't want age to be Bob because if you're saying, you know, 12 plus 13 plus 15 plus Bob plus 17 plus 12 divided by six, whatever, to get the, to get the average, right? Bob, Bob is not a number. So what you're going to get is you're going to get a mess. Uh, when it, With databases or with programming, it's called garbage in, garbage out. And so if you do something such as put Bob into the into a field uh, where they're expecting a number, and that actually goes into a database, that can cause all kinds of hell. So what you can do is you can assign a data type for that column, for that field, and say it will only accept integers. So basically, if, if you try to insert Bob into uh, a column that has a data type of integer, it will simply fail out. And so that's a very important thing to have happen. And so when you're dealing with, uh, with tables and you're dealing with these different columns, Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to go in and you're going to assign uh, what type of data uh, data type is supposed to be there. Is it is it text? Is it int? And it's an important thing to be thinking about, like with numbers. So int is different than float. So write int, an integer, is 1, 2, 10, 100. Right? But you'll notice there's no decimal points there. A float is a decimal point. You know, so 10.2. 10.55, uh, so on and so forth. So that's one of the things you're gonna have to be thinking about when you create the columns, when you create the data uh, that's gonna be put into your database. Again, it's little things such as, is it going to be an integer? Is it going to be a float? Is it going to be a long? So even with numbers, uh, there's different data types to put in there. Um, and if you screw up the data type, you could run into some different problems. So this is basically what the tables look like when you're gonna be dealing with uh, with with my sequel now past the tables then you're going to get to the individual records and so basically again we go back to that table and so we go like again we create users we create the columns like we did before and so we have user id we have name we have email we have age we have whatever else and so basically then past that what we're going to be talking about is the records and so the records or the rows the rows are the actual information that you're putting into the database. So user ID one, name is Bob, Bob, you know, at AOL.com, and Bob is 12. Uh, user ID two is Sue, uh, Sue at Hotmail.com, and she's 15. Uh, user three is Tim, you know, Tim at Outlook.com, and, you know, 17, so on and so forth. So this is where we're talking about rows or records. So this is an important thing. Sometimes people get confused about this when they're new. Basically, when we're talking about columns. So columns is the up and down, and so that is the data that you're bringing in, the user ID and the data type. Across, those are the rows or those are the records, and that's the individual, like I say, the user account uh, or the part ID or the invoice ID, that type of thing. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about columns and then we're talking about rows. So with all this talk about databases and tables and rows and records, basically what we have been talking about here is what is called the schema. So the schema is this is the design of your database, right? So you have uh, your database. So I don't know, uh, ETCG database. In that database, you have a users table. In that users table, there's the, the columns, you know, user ID, uh, name, age. Uh, then maybe you have a parts table, and that has a part ID, uh, name, description, whole nine yards, right? And so basically when we're talking about the schema, we're talking about what does this whole database look like? So you have the, the database is ETCG, you have a table called users, you have a table called parts. Within the users table, you have user ID, you have name, you have age. Within the parts table, you have part ID, you have name, you have description, you have price or whatever else. And so this is the schema. So why the schema is important and can become a real pain in the butt 
is do remember many times the front end developers, right? Remember we talked about the front end and the back end developers uh, can be two different people, can be two different teams. They can be teams that aren't even on the same darn continent, right? But the important thing to understand is when you have the front end developers, they can only send data or retrieve data from whatever has been created in the database. So the schema in the database, right? So they need to connect to the ETCG database. They then need to go to the users table. They then need to pull out information from the users table. Or if a new user account is created, they need to connect to the ETCG, ETCG database and then send data to the particular table, right? Well, here's one of the problems. What if you have the front end developers, right? And so we've been getting user ID and we've been getting name, we've getting age. And then the front end developers go, oh, you know, you know what we really need here? We need t-shirt size, right? We need to start giving out t-shirts to, uh, to the people that, that sign up uh, for our service. So we need to know what size they are. You know, are they small, medium, or large? Well, one of the problems you can get into is the front end developers can actually code all this in to their front end. But here's the thing, you have this schema. So this schema is basically hard coded in here. So until your database administrators create a t-shirt column for you, there's no place to be able to actually put the data that the front end developers want to get uh, from, from the users. And so this is where you'll hear of some databases where they're called schema lists. So some types of databases such as NoSQL databases don't have a schema. You can literally, the coders, the coders can literally grab data and they can, they can associate it with whatever they want. They just dump it in and they just pull it out willy nilly that you don't have to get the database administrators involved. But when you're dealing with something like MySQL, basically when you're pushing and pulling the data, there needs to be a place for that data. If you do not have a t-shirt column, then there is no place to put the t-shirt data. So not only do you need to put the t-shirt code into that front end, but you also need to make sure you go back into uh, the users table and actually create a t-shirt column there, and then make sure that you have the appropriate data type. So again, what kind of data type do you want? Do you want it to be an integer? So an integer, so maybe small is one, uh, medium is two, and large is three, so that would be an int data type and so basically you would have the code send one of those numbers or do you want it to be text so text is where it actually be small you know medium large so do you want that to be sent to the database that's some of the things that you have to think about with the schema and so how the database and how the front end will actually be working together and make sure both your database people and your front end people are on the same page and now the final thing to go over is something called the storage engine. Um, so basically, uh, if you're new to the MySQL world, uh, even if you're not new to the MySQL world, if there's no reason to mess with your storage engine, don't mess with the storage engine, right? So basically what the storage engine is, is this is the code that actually manages the database itself. So when you do a search on the database, when you're inputting data into the tables, the storage engine is what is actually going to be doing this. Uh, so when you think about a storage engine, kind of think about it like the VoIP world. So if you're dealing with voice over IP, you install a Cisco call manager system, you install some kind of voice over IP system, you install your phones, and then you can choose a codec. Right, so so you have poly polycom phones. You've got a Cisco call manager. You've got all that kind of thing. But then the actual software, the actual encoding for the voice communication is done by the codec. Kind of think of the storage engine as like the codec uh, for your MySQL database. This is this is the so the the actual component of the software that's allowing you to do the searches, is allowing you to write records into the database and actually pull data out of the database. Uh, there are different storage engines out there. Um, the, the one that is currently um, uh, the default uh, for MySQL and has been for a while is something called InnoDB, um, and this works fine. <laughs> This works fine. Uh, one of the problems, again, you run into in the real world with new people is they go, ooh, look, we have options. Let's play with options. 
Um, let, let me be clear. There are reasons to use other storage engines. Um, once, once you really know what a storage engine is, once you know why you might want a, a storage engine other than InnoDB, then by all means, change the storage engine. But different storage engines, basically, what they do is, is they actually do the process of putting the data into the database, being able to do the searches. And so different uh, storage engines work better in different capacities. Um, again, InnoDB is the default for MySQL right now. Just leave it. Like literally, this isn't something, again, it's like a codec. It's like a codec. When, when you're dealing with scale, if you have a voice over IP system and you have a thousand people on your voice over IP system, then changing the codec uh, will make a lot of difference for your enterprise. But if, you think, if, if you're simply playing around, you have one voice over IP phone on your desk, and connecting to a server, you're most likely not going to notice a lot of difference with the codec. It's not really going to matter. It's kind of the same thing with these storage engines, right? If you're not in a production environment, if you're not hammering the hell out of your server, you're not, it's only going to turn into a mess if you try to do different storage engines. So it's just stay with InnoDB. Uh, you'll be happy for it. <laughs> Again, once, once you learn a lot more, then mess around with the storage engines. I just want to tell you they exist. This is one of those things where it's like, look, storage engines exist. And don't don't play with it. Don't 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 touch. Don't don't touch. So that's a basic overview of what a MySQL structure will look like for you, right? So you're going to have a server. And so that's either going to be a physical server or that's going to be a virtual machine. You're going to have an operating system installed onto that physical or virtual machine. Again, that could be Linux, that could be Windows, that could be Mac OS. Then on top of that, you will install MySQL and that will then give you a MySQL database server. Now for the backend component, you may have one single server, you may have have a cluster of servers you may have a very sophisticated environment there but the key thing is basically you've got you've got a server it's got an operating system it's got the database software installed on that and then you build everything out past that uh, again when you're dealing with the actual finished product that your users are going to be interacting with you're going to have a front end and a back end so your MySQL database infrastructure whether it's one single server or a cluster that is going to be what's called your back end the front end is the interface that your users are going to be using. Again, whether that is a mobile, a native mobile app on iOS or Android, whether that is a web application, whether that's some other kind of wacky thing that you've created, do remember, again, all the database does, people get really confused with this sometimes, all the database does is store the data, right? It's just, it's just a place to store names and ages and SKUs and that type of stuff, right? Um, actually interacting with that data, that is what you're going to use a front end for, for and that is something that, that you or somebody else will be coding on your own. So again, this is an important thing. A lot of times people install a database server. Again, they have this idea of access. So access is a piece of software from Microsoft. It's, it's a database software that comes with the database and it comes with a front end and it comes with intelligence and it comes with everything so basically you can just build it something right out of the box do understand with mysql the other databases that's not the case you install the database you either have data in it or not and then you have to build a front end out of something maybe it's built out of php maybe it's built out of ruby maybe it's built a native application right but you have to build something to actually be able to connect back to the database. Then when you're actually looking at the database server and you're looking at the, the structure you create within the database server, the highest level in a database is a database itself. So again, if you have a small company uh, or you don't need to, to input a lot of different types of information, you may have a single database for your company. Again, you may have one CRM database or you may have one invoicing database and that's what contains all the data for your company. But again, if you have a larger company, you may think of about having a CRM database and a work order database for your fuel technicians and some kind of inventory database. The reason that that's important is because you can have different permissions for those databases. Again, from a security standpoint, if one of the databases gets compromised, then you only have to worry about that one database getting compromised. So your CRM database got corrupted or got compromised, but at least your inventory and your sales uh, databases are continuing to work. And it's important to understand, again, when we talk about the front end and the back end, when you code the front 
end, you can actually code the front end to communicate with multiple different databases. So again, if you had a senior level technician in the field, maybe you want your senior level technicians not only to be able to do work orders, but also to be able to do sales, right? Upsell. Again, upsell or die. If you're if you're in the real world with business, upsell, upsell, upsell. So you can have your senior technician come out and the application that they're using, the front end that they're using, not only connects to the work order system, but it may also connect to the sales system. So they can say, okay, we've done all the work for you today. Have you thought about buying some more clients or upgrading your server or doing something else. Since I'm here, um, I, you know, I can actually input that, at, input that into my system and I can sell that to you today. And so that's an important thing to realize is it's not like when you create these different databases, they are self, they're self-contained uh, to one degree, but you can create code that then marries the data amongst these different databases into that one front end that your users are going to be using. Once you get past that, once you get into the database itself, then you get into the tables. So again, the tables should be logical containers for data. Your users table, your parts table, your accounts table, your invoices table, that type of thing. Again, remember, when you're designing a database, <laughs> it can be ugly as hell and function. <laughs> Just realize this. In the real world, it can be ugly, messy, nasty. No one can understand what the hell they're looking at. And it can still function all at the same time. So one of the things when you're designing your database system is you want to, to basically lump lump like things together, right? So users go into the users table, you know, vendors go into the vendors table, parts go into the parts table. And then from that, you'll create the code to actually connect those different tables together uh, to, to be able to push or pull information out. Within the tables, that's where you have the, the, the column names. And so again, you'll have like a user ID or a part ID. Uh, the first column is generally what is called the primary key in a table. So again, every record in a table needs to be unique. If you have two records that are identical, that can cause all kinds of problems. You create what's called the primary key. The primary key, uh, you have that be absolutely unique. So even if the other information in, in two records is identical, at least the primary key will be different. So therefore, there will be unique records. Generally, again, in the beginning, when you're learning to code, you simply auto what's called auto increment uh, the primary key. So the first record is one, and then it automatically means the next record is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. As you get more complicated, as you learn more, there, there are different ways to create those, those unique primary keys, but generally you do auto increment. Past that, again, if you're dealing with the users table, then you would have the name, then you would have the age, and you have the email address, so on and so forth. The important thing to understand there is that you can then state what data type uh, you want that field uh, to actually be able to accept. So if you're trying to get names from people, you want that to be text, right? So Eli. Right. Uh, on the other hand, if you're looking for age or prices or social security numbers, anything that might be a number, you don't want people to put Bob in there. <laughs> right. Again, like if you're trying, if you're trying to, to add up a receipt, you know, this item's one dollar and this item's two dollars and this item's Bob dollars and this item's five dollars, and then you try to add that all hell is going to take place. And so one of the things you can do is you can assign a data type. So again, for price, for age, for that type of thing, you can say this will only accept an int. But again, it is important with numbers. An int is a whole number. One, two, 20, 50, 1,050. Uh, whereas a float, a float is a number with a decimal point. Uh, 110, 1.10. Uh, Twenty dot fifty, you know that type of thing. So that that's what a float is. Um, and so again, one of the things you have to be thinking with the data type is make sure to really be thinking about what kind of data you want to be accepting, uh, and then you put that data type in there. And it's important to understand when you create the front end, if somebody puts in a different type of data that can be accepted into that that particular. Uh, field in the database, uh, then then the insert command basically will fail out. So if you try to put Bob in the age, it will fail out. Uh, and you want that because you don't want people putting Bob into ages or Bob into prices, that type of thing. Then again, once you have the, the columns, the column names, the data types, then you have the records. So again, you know, 
user ID one equals Eli, Eli at gmail.com, age 40. You know, record two, Sue, Sue at hotmail.com, age 25, so on and so forth. And then those are the records. Uh, and then finally, as I talked about, again, that whole idea of the schema. The schema is this whole design that we've created, the database name, the table names, the column names, all of that information. The important thing to realize with that is when people are coding for the front end, they cannot send data to fields that do not exist. <laughs> They cannot retrieve data from fields that do not exist. And so your front-end developers and your back-end developers have to be at least kind of sort of on the same page uh, so that when they're developing the full application, that the, the data that is being brought in uh, by the front-end has some place to go, and that when the front-end is requesting data, that it's actually requesting data from the right place. So this is one problem you can run into with schemas, is when you have different people or different departments uh, trying to create a front-end and a back-end, they may they name thing. They may not realize what the naming convention is. They may not realize where data is stored within particular tables, um, and that can cause real problems. That's why there are some databases out there, uh, not MySQL, that are called uh, schema list databases. And schema list databases, basically, the front end people just dump data in all day. They don't need no schema. Um, but that's not MySQL, and that's something we'll talk about later. So that kind of just gives you like an overall idea uh, of what's going on with the, the MySQL structure. So when you start thinking about this, when you start actually going out there to build a database-based uh, system, uh, or if you're trying to maintain one, you can, can have a better idea of what's going on. Uh, the final thing again, is there is something called a storage engine. And a storage engine, that's kind of thing like geeks are like, ooh, I wanna play with storage engines. Don't, <laughs> just don't. The storage engine is the component that actually does uh, basically the, the searching through the database, uh, does the write, does the reads. Uh, there are reasons why you may want to change uh, from the default storage engine. So the default storage engine in MySQL is currently, it's called InnoDB, uh, which will be fine for you. Again, if you're installing WordPress, if you're building your stupid your stupid little app, InnoDB is going to be fine. There may be reasons to change the storage engine, but don't change it until you know what the hell you're doing and you know why you're doing it because it can run into a lot of a lot of weird kind of problems and you don't want to be dealing with weird kind of problems right now so just 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 don't mess with the storage engine it's it's fine <laughs> it's fine leave it where it is so as always uh, so uh, ah, um, that was a basic introduction to uh, MySQL uh, structure as always I enjoyed uh, doing this class and look forward to seeing you in the next one